Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii Asia and Review. I am Johnson Choi, the host. The guest today today is Benjamin Chen, attorney at law. Uh, Benjamin has been attorney practicing law in Hawaii for almost 25 years. I have known Ben probably for at least 10 to 15 years. Today our topic is uh, talk about uh, immigration uh, to United States via investment. Uh, ben, uh, first of all, I want to find out how do foreigners that wish to migrate to the United States, uh, what are the means for them to do so? Well, uh, immigration law is, uh, as you know, is a federal law, and uh, it's uh, been in the books for, for since the founding of the country. But uh, the four basic ways that a foreigner can immigrate is, one is family relationships, the second is through employment, the third is through investment, and then the fourth is through a visa uh, lottery selection. I see. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can show uh, the graph number one so people can uh, take a look. Uh, As you can see uh, on figure one, the um, number of uh, immigrants um, that are coming to the U.S., uh, 480,000 are through family-sponsored immigration. 140,000 through employment based and that out of that 140 includes the um, immigrant investors visa uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later and then lastly it's through the visa uh, lottery program which is called the diversity program okay maybe we we'll go to the next graph and in this table you can see the actual number of um, uh, people that immigrated to the US um, based upon the various categories and uh, of the 675 um, you can see that from 2010 to 2014 total number of uh, uh, investors through the um, uh, the various family employment diversity and also the immigrant investors uh, come out to about a million fifty thousand and then within the employment based categories you see there is uh, the EB-1, which is through priority workers, the EB-2, which are professionals uh, holding advanced degrees, and EB-3, skilled workers, and EB-4, religious workers, and um, special immigrants. And for EB-5 is where uh, the immigrant investors uh, make an investment in the United States, whether it be a million dollars to uh, through, for a, a direct job um, creation, or through a five hundred thousand uh, dollar indirect job creation I program. See. Okay, you mentioned about the three ways uh, uh, to come into America uh, uh, through family employment investment. Of the right. three ways, uh, which way is the easiest, and which way is the most difficult? The easiest is actually through the uh, lottery selection. I oh. think every year uh, the uh, Congress allows uh, several tens of thousands of uh, people to come in. Fifty-five thousand, actually, for this fiscal year to come into the United States through a visa selection. So basically, if you're selected, you- You're uh, lucky. You're lucky, right. <laughs> okay. So you get it, you can come in and a, a visa process at the uh, country where you're at. Uh, the second easiest way would be through the family. Uh, typically, you would have to just prove the family relationship, right. whether it's uh, through a spousal relationship right. or through a, a children and parent relationship, and uh, even brothers and sisters, uh, which is like the fourth preference right. category. Right. Um, then this, the third uh, easiest, I guess the third way would be through employment. You would have to have a job offer by a U.S. employer uh, who can petition you. And then the last would be the immigrant investors. I, I would say that's the most um, difficult yes. and also the most risky. Okay. And yet it's uh, very, very popular now, especially among uh, Chinese immigrants. Okay. Well, let's talk about the immigration uh, investor uh, program. Uh, we sure. call it a company, refer that to EB-5. Right. As that mean, uh, as I mean, uh, in recent years to be the most popular way to, mig uh, up to migrate to the United States. Uh, can you tell us more about it? Sure. Uh, the EB-5 program, uh, EB-5 stands for Employment Base 5, and I think you saw that in the right. last uh, table, which shows Employment Base 5 category. Uh, basically, it's, it's uh, a program that was uh, created by Congress through the Immigration Act of 1990. And so this law has been on the books for over 25 years. And for the 
first 25 years, I'm sorry, the first 15 years, excuse me, the program was not as successful because uh, the applicants were, were very few. So uh, the program actually at one point was, you know, uh, going to be canceled. But within the last 10 years, the program has gotten a lot of uh, attraction because primarily the Chinese applicants. Oh, the Chinese are coming. Right. <laughs> so from 2005 uh, to present, um, most of the uh, applicants are from China. I see. And the rule, the basic rule for the immigration, uh, this EB-5 program is investment of a million dollars and the creation of 10 jobs, full-time jobs, okay. for qualified U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents. And the second component to this uh, investment immigration program is investment in what's called a targeted employment area. Now, a targeted employment area is, in, in simplest terms, would be um, where unemployment is high okay. in areas of the United States. So an investment of $500,000 and the creation of 10 U.S. jobs would qualify somebody to obtain lawful permanent residence. Does Hawaii have uh, any of these uh, uh, regional centers for the EB-5 investment? Okay, going, uh, going a step back. Okay. Now, these target employment areas uh, now, you know, through the uh, IM Act uh, 1990, um, allows the creation of certain regional centers. And these regional centers are economic units uh, within a defined geographical boundary that is supposed to create employment opportunities uh, for U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents. So since 1993, uh, the U.S. Immigration Service allows um, entrepreneurs to create these regional centers and then sponsor projects that are within these regional, uh, these ge geographical boundaries, yeah. Okay, so back to my question, is there any of those uh, regional centers right now in Hawaii? Yes, in fact, Hawaii itself as a state is a regional center. I see. Uh, that was established back in the late 1990s. And originally it was managed by the state of Hawaii through the Department of Business and Economic I Development see. and Tourism. Yeah. Right. And uh, more recently, I'd say probably the last 10 years, it's been managed by a private company. Uh, and they have certain projects that they sponsor. But as of uh, October uh, this year, uh, there are 12 uh, regional centers that have been approved by the uh, USCIS. In Hawaii. Uh, right. Yeah. So I don't know um, a lot about the regional centers that are, that are operating here. Some are actually sponsoring uh, real estate projects. Uh, I know there's another one that's uh, on the outer islands that's doing an uh, um, assisted living project. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of uh, real estate uh, development, development projects are being offered? And then uh, can a developer uh, offer EP5 investment unit uh, for commercial office or mixed-use uh, mixed mixed building or even a hotel? Yes, uh, a lot of the regional centers that uh, sponsor, they sponsor projects involving real estate development. I see. And that's been where most of the activity has been concentrated uh, in real estate developments. Okay. So a uh, project uh, could be a uh, office building, a mixed-use uh, commercial and residential project, uh, condominiums, um, uh, housing developments, hotels, motels, and even some in the high-tech industry. I know uh, a client that actually uh, invests in a restaurant, which is a uh, very high risk too. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Um, how can an investor uh, or a EB-5 visa purchaser, uh, you know, uh, understand the risk involved in, in a program like that, a project like that? Uh, for regional centers, uh, the lot of most of these, like I said, was are in uh, real estate development, I see. and um, the investor needs to understand the risks involved in um, investing in these types of projects. They're not buying a piece of real estate. They're not buying a condo. They're not buying the hotel. They're really investing in a securities interest in the um, what's called the new commercial enterprise. I see. Now, in these regional center um, offerings, the uh, investor is investing in a share of securities in this new commercial enterprise which is going to loan the money to the project entity. So it's not a purchase of real estate because there's, the law doesn't you know, allow you to redeem your investment uh, for a 
say, a unit uh, in, a, in a condo development. So it's really important for the investors to understand uh, real estate financing and also understand the uh, capital stack that uh, goes into particular projects. Now, I know in um, Asia, particularly in China, a lot of these projects are promoted through uh, migration agents. And uh, these migration agents uh, originally started out uh, as mom and pop shops that uh, assist um, clients with visa uh, services and also helping uh, their children go to School. summer camps okay. uh, and uh, English language programs. But as the EB-5 program has gained popularity, a lot of these migration agents are now you know, in the roles of investment advisors. And that becomes quite dangerous because uh, a lot of them do not know or understand uh, okay. real estate financing and to um, inform the investor about the risks involved in the projects. The price is a program coming up here. Uh, you talk about uh, where the EP5 investment, where they place in the stack of investment. Right. Maybe briefly explain the stack. Okay. okay. Yeah, sure. Well, very fast, maybe. How? Okay. Uh, typically, in larger projects, Johnson, um, you know, office buildings, the uh, developer usually has an equity in, in the land. And then uh, f with the land, uh, the developer would go to a bank and get a, a loan, hard, typically a hard money loan secured by the land. So right there, you have a first deed of trust that's I already see. I see. on the land. And subsequently, the, pers the, the developer could go out and get a construction loan. And that construction loan is going to likely be second in the stack. And of the projects that uh, I've seen, um, the EB-5 stack typically is in the third position or in the fourth position. And so that becomes kind of dangerous for the investor because if the first deed of trust or the second deed of trust, uh, the mortgage is defaulted, then everything else below gets wiped out. So it's very, very uh, risky in that sense if the uh, developer doesn't go through with the project. Okay. Uh, I guess the, one of the best way for a lot of people who own homes will be you have your first mortgage, right. and then you have a second mortgage when you want to send a right. kid to Harvard, you have sure. a third mortgage. Right, <laughs> right. right. That's a so pretty, it's yeah. a, if going to default, the, the first mortgage get paid back first. And right. second and third, and then the EP5 is there in the, in the latter position. So they right. may not have anything left if somehow the program didn't work out. That's right. right. And, okay. and, and, and uh, so uh, the, uh, the projects that are being marketed out there, in fact, I think there are uh, hundreds of projects that are being marketed in China right now. And mainly they are larger uh, real estate developments. Okay. Uh, we're going to commercial in about a minute. Uh, very quickly, does the uh, investor has to go uh, to, a, to a, what we call a, uh, a migration agent to do it? Uh, not necessarily, not but okay. in China, the, the typical practice is to go to a migration I agent see, for help. But the migration agent's uh, role uh, can be of a conflict to the I investor see, see, because see. the migration agents are also representing the project developers oh, okay. to market the project. So, in like China. a real estate agent represented by and sellers. Right. So okay. he's, he's based. The migration agent is basically a dual agent. So okay. where are his or her loyalties? Okay. Is it to the developer or is it to the investor? So that becomes a, a source of uh, a conflict. Okay. Let's go into a quick break, and then when we come back, we have more questions for uh, attorney Benjamin Chen. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. 
Hey everybody, my name is David Chang and I'm the new host of a new show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you secrets on giving yourself the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests and great mentors of mine from the political, military, business, nonprofit, you name it. So it's something for everybody. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Asian Review. I'm Johnson Choi, the host. The guest today is Benjamin Chen, attorney at law. Uh, we were talking about uh, using uh, uh, agents in China, and then uh, the other question I heard a lot is, if I invest in a project in California, right. EP5 project, regional center, do I have to live in California? But I like Hawaii. So, so what's the answer for the? The answer investment? is no, you don't. Uh, you can invest in a an investor can invest in a uh, project in uh, California and live in Hawaii. Uh, they can even invest in a project on the East Coast and live in Hawaii. So okay. it, there's no uh, any restriction. Of the state, anyway. Right. There's no legal okay. restriction on where you can reside after you've made an EB-5 investment. Okay. Well, you mentioned about the fraud and misrepresentation uh, by agent in Asia. Right. And are uh, those cases, uh, are there cases in U.S. That, that you may be able to share with us? Well, I'm uh, not necessarily saying that the <laughs> migration agents uh, commit fraud, but I'm okay. saying that a lot of the information that, that potentially uh, goes into the ears of the investors may not be what the developer had initially uh, 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 discussed with the migration agents because the migration agents are so driven uh, by commissions to sell the investment unit that they can say uh, almost anything to make the sale. And it's been uh, well documented that a lot of the migration agents uh, in Asia uh, don't necessarily provide uh, the accurate information and so um, that's where problems could occur. Well you mentioned conflict of interest right? If right. I handle a project A in California and project B in Hawaii, right. the project A offer me say 75,000 commission right. to push it right. and Hawaii only offer me 25,000. Right. Uh, as of a course. migration agent, uh, well, as being a human being and right. want to make more money, they will probably push. So there's no limit how much they, they charge on a uh, well, project? Well, I was in Shanghai about a month ago, and uh, one of the things I've discovered was that uh, through my uh, research and uh, meetings with various um, interested parties, there's a number of migration agents are now taking up to five to six handling five to six cases for developers and marketing them in China. And you touched upon the point is that, um, you know, there's also conflict amongst the project offerings themselves because if a migration agent takes on six projects, which one is he going to promote first? Well, Obviously, you're going to promote the one that, pay the that most. pays you the most commission. Yeah. And you're going to do that to the detriment of the other four or I five see. projects that you've also signed on. So. There are quite a bit of problems with that, I see, I see. and I think um, that's not that's something that um, uh, you know projects will end up having to deal with with the with that particular agent because there's so many projects out there. In fact, uh, as of uh, October, there are 850 over 850 regional centers in the United States. Wow! And you can imagine uh, how many projects are out there uh, competing for competing the dollar. for the dollar. Wow. Yeah. I guess those that are not raising money and need to close a project will be quite desperate to pay sure. high fee. Sure, and there's yeah. uh, articles that written about it uh, you know, this year talking about how the uh, larger national developers are getting most of the action I see. and the medium size to the smaller size developers are not getting any I action see. See. because essentially is um, you know, who's going to pay the developer, I'm sorry, who's going to pay the uh, migration agent the uh, commission that they want. I see. Well, what's the, sta uh, the status or the state of the EB-5 visa program now at this stand? Well, there, uh, the September 30 with, was the uh, deadline for uh, either to extend the program permanently or um, discontinue it. Uh, Congress, uh, uh, prior to September 30, uh, agreed to extend the program till December 9th of this year. And this is called the reauthorization bill. And within the reauthorization bill, there are certain discussions uh, among uh, congressional members as to whether or not to increase the, the uh, investment amount. Currently, the $500,000 uh, 
uh, amount may be increased to 800, and for the direct investment could be increased from 1 million to 1.2. So that's something that Congress is still debating. The second issue is the definition of what is a target employment area. And uh, through my um, participation in various immigration lawyer conferences and also um, discussions uh, you know, in the specialty of the EB-5 uh, area, there's been uh, complaints by regional centers that operate in smaller states oh. and in rural states that are not getting the funding, the funding from through the EB-5 program. So it's, uh, Congress has now um, considered this uh, problem and potentially could change the definition of what is a target employment area to actually benefit the rural areas. A lot of the action now is occurring in uh, larger states like in California, New York, and uh, in Texas and Florida, but not so in the smaller states. So with, if that definition changes, then I think many of the projects that are on the market today could be affected. Uh, the third issue would be compliance because of the, um, you know, a few of the larger cases, uh, you know, in 2013 where there was fraud. I think in 2013 there was a Chicago case that uh, was investigated. In 2014 there was a Seattle case that was investigated. And more recently this year there was a well-known uh, East Coast uh, Regional Center that uh, was being investigated for fraud and misrepresentation. So given that, I think um, Congress is now very mindful of you know, enforcement and compliance uh, issues, and all of those are being considered in this bill. So we'll see um, what, what happens uh, in December 9th. I saw some of your, uh, the cases, the problem case you mentioned, and yes. I noticed they all fall at the same, uh, the, the, the way they do it is they hire very high profile people as promoter in the United States sure. as the front and then, I mean, typical, the old Chinese way is, you know, they start someone that is uh, seen in TV, are, are popular, and promote the program must be something good, but sometimes right. it turns out the other way. <laughs> right, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. yeah. So um, it's really not... So do your homework, that's right. amazing. Do your, I don't do your care diligence. who this guy is, uh, how big shot he was or sure. he is, you know, uh, do your homework. Right. Uh, since most of our viewers on this program, uh, at least, you know, Asian Review are, are in Asia. Right. And uh, I'd like to address the program and uh, you to address the program and its impact on the Chinese investors. Well, uh, Chinese investors, as I mentioned at the top of the program, now um, occupy 90% or more of the uh, EB-5 uh, activity. And I don't know if I mentioned uh, this, but uh, the number of visas that are allowed per year, per fiscal year on the EB-5 program is 10,000. So the Chinese applicants have now uh, occupied more than 90%. So um, this impacts upon them the most. And the number, the sheer number of uh, visa applications that are in the USCIS pipeline today are close to 10,000. I see, I see. So there's um, a backlog of cases that need to be worked on, that need to be adjudicated by the USCIS, and currently it's taking 17 months just to adjudicate a conditional uh, green card application. Okay, and that's not including the time that a Chinese investor has to wait for him to apply for the conditional green card, which could be another 24 months. Wow. So if you, years, almost. yeah, you could essentially, the Chinese investor typically, well, given the current um, processing time and the wait involved, it could be up to four years before the investor actually obtains I his see. conditional green card. Okay. Uh, where do you see the EB-5 programs heading? You know, especially nowadays, uh, there's already a lot of Chinese investment right. coming in the state, and there's a lot of uh, hearing what the newspaper and also even some of the presidential debate. Right. They are afraid too many investment coming to the United States, buying up too many things, mm -hmm. and there's a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look at, say, 90% of the EB-5 visa, people are Chinese, would that be after the election maybe? Uh, they well, will do something to not to uh -huh. encourage so many Chinese coming into America? Or well, the I think Congress uh, uh, extended the program this time uh, to December 9th, I see. 
uh, probably after to wait until yeah, after the election is over to see who gets in. Um, obviously, um, that's uh, going to be whoever gets in is going to potentially dictate what happens to the uh, immigration um, issue as a whole, not necessarily the B5 and also program. the mix of the Congress, too. Of course, yeah, so. and, that, and that's important. Um, so I think for the B5 program and as you know, to where it's going to go, it remains to be seen. But of course, for investors, certainty is always important. Right. right. So if policy catches up with uh, politics. The, the politics, then I think you, you, can, you, know, you can have some um, certainty as to what you can do as an investor in terms of you know, business decision making. Currently, um, most of the, uh, of the, uh, the blogs that I've seen in, in, uh, in China, the immigration blogs, a lot of the investors are just sort of on the fence and waiting okay. to see what happens. About the election? Potentially. And I think uh, a lot of the uh, uh, investors are waiting to see whether or not this program, the EB-5 program, gets extended permanently for five years. Um, during this last round, it was only extended for one year. I see. So in one year, there's not much certainty as to uh, you know, the, the program as, and then how it's going to be uh, uh, funded and also uh, the rules of the game needs to be addressed. So I think people are waiting. Uh, but I think as, as far as you know, um, the program is concerned, it's a good program. It's brought in uh, billions of dollars of uh, investment money to help create jobs in the nice. U.S. But it has to be done in a way that it's fair to not just the larger developers, but it's fair to everyone. Well, since the people who invest in project uh, could be in Wisconsin and could still live in California, New York, and Hawaii, I guess it really doesn't matter. The main thing is uh, to do the due diligence, make sure wherever you invest the money, uh, sure. it's a good investment. Right. Uh, notice you handle immigration cases, and if someone calls you from Shanghai and say, Ben, you know, I'd like to come to America, and uh, sure. what will you tell them? Uh, I want you to retain you uh, <laughs> as a client. I'm going to send you 10000 as a retainer fee, but you help me to... Do you help well, you try sure. to Sure. We'll, we'll evaluate the uh, circumstances of the investor okay. and go over the uh, options, the I various see. options with them. EB-5 may not necessarily I be see. the route uh, given today's climate, but there could be other investment, uh, I'm sorry, considerations. Uh, immigration right. considerations, right. Okay, Ben, uh, thank you for coming thank you. to our show today. Okay, thank and, you, Johnson. Uh, looking forward to see you again in okay. the future. All right, thanks, Johnson.